Open your Bibles, if you would, to Judges chapter 6. I'm going to look at a few things tonight. The Lord is so good. He blesses us. Now, I know that uh, Sunday night services, you know, through the, from here on out, we'll let you know when we're going to kick it back on, okay? Kind of from here on out, we're going to uh, enjoy the holidays and uh, spend more time with family. Uh, I think we've got some visitors with us. We are glad you're here. We meet on Sunday mornings, too, <laughs> and Wednesday nights. And, uh, but uh, through the holidays, we will uh, uh, suspend our evening service. So glad you're here. And thankful for those who are watching on the World Wide Web. And we pray the Lord will bless you and encourage you and meet your needs. The book of Judges is an interesting book. It is uh, sandwiched in there, you know, for 1 Samuel. And it is uh, really the last verse in the Bible sums up the book of Judges. Uh, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's the theme of Judges. Everybody's their own standard. Everybody's their own God. You know, everybody's their own uh, thermostat of correctness. And, and we always get in trouble when we go there. Always. Never fails. And so the children of Israel are living in this way. You know, they, they uh, stray into sin and God judges them and it's rough. And then they repent. God raises up someone to lead them, and they experience revival. And then it gets good, and we get prosperous, and we get comfortable, and then we take credit for it all and forget God, and then the cycle just continues on and on and on and on. It's the way it's always been. You know? I mean, it's, it, the human history is full of this. Just on and on and on and on and again. There, there are a, a whole generation among us today who doesn't understand history. They're completely unlearned and doesn't know anything about our history. And they, they don't even know who Hitler was. Not, not sure why we fought World War II. Don't know what World War I was all about. They think the Kaiser is aluminum foil. You know, Kaiser aluminum, Kaiser makes, he, he was the aluminum magnet and out of that come aluminum foil. I had to clarify myself here. Uh, help me Jesus. Well, here we are in, uh, in Judges chapter six, verse one. And, uh, uh, Israel's at it again. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, you know, they didn't think it was evil. They thought well, what they were doing was okay. They convinced themselves it was, it was morally okay, it was spiritually okay, it was politically okay. It was just okay. So the Lord delivered them in the hand of Midian for seven years. Now, these Midianites weren't nice people. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. The children of Israel made themselves dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. So it was when Israel had sown, Midianites would come up, and, and also Amalekites, and the people of the east would come up against them, and they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance. Uh, for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey, for they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts, and both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land and destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Mennonites and the children of Israel. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Can I tell you what re rebellion against God will always do? 
what, what rebellion, turning against God and doing your own way and doing your own thing, it always, always will hurt the people economically. It always does. It impoverishes. You see what happened to them? It will always do that. Always. It hits us in the pocketbook. It hits us in our prosperity. Why is that? Because God is the giver of prosperity. God is the giver of blessing. God is the, the giver of, of promotion and a better, a better way and a better opportunity. And here we see the children of Israel doing evil in the sight of God. They've redefined sin. They've redefined right and wrong. They redefined correctness and morality. And they're doing their own thing. And God says, okay, you think that's bad. I'm going to bring in a bunch that's worse than you. And I am going to let you know what it is to rebel against me. And for seven years... They lived this way. They lived on the run in fear. They lived in a, in a place where they just didn't know, oh, tough times. You're talking about inflation and recession and depression and all that other stuff. You're talking about your buying power uh, go, diminished. You're talking about how are we going to make ends meet? And this is where the children of Israel find themselves. They're in, a, they're in a hard place. They're in a bad place. They're in a tight spot. And so, go to verse 11. Now, the people are crying out. In America, it hadn't got bad enough yet. We're not crying out yet. We're not crying out. Oh, there are pockets of people crying out, you know. There's five, six churches banded together, and we've been meeting and praying and meet on Thursday night at Crossroads, and, and the leadership meets Sunday morning, 630, right, out, right here. And we pray, and we, we press in, and we're asking God. But, but for the most part, most people aren't desperate enough for God to move. We're not desperate enough to uh, really see how great our need is. But when it gets bad enough, when the, when the soup lines and the bread lines get long enough, when enough people lose what they think is theirs and they think they're the ones who got it, when things like that start happening, then we'll get desperate enough to call on God. You say, Pastor, I don't like to hear that. I don't like telling you. But it's the truth. It's the truth. And so it got bad enough. It got bad enough. I mean, how would you like to live in your house and always have to carry a gun to the door when someone knocks? That doesn't sound too inviting, do you? Do you? I mean, why, why has legal gun sales in America gone up 25% since the election? I don't want to have to live that way, do you? So I'm going to seek him before it gets too desperate. I'm going to seek him. Now, I advise everybody to have a gun in their house. <laughs> I do, <laughs> but I don't carry it to the door every time the doorbell rings. Do you understand? I think I need to be a good steward and protector of my family, but I don't advise, you know, everybody start packing one. We've not got that desperate yet. And so the people of Israel... The chosen people of God, the people who have been in the land for 3,800 years that the world's trying to shove off that land today, and they've been there 3,800 years because God gave it to them. And so 
Verse 11, now the angel of the Lord came and sat under a terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, and he was a Abizrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press. Now, I want you to understand, the wine press is not where you're supposed to thresh wheat. But when you're worried about somebody stealing everything that you have, you will do whatever is necessary in order to get the job done. Is everybody with me? And so he's in the wine, he's in the wrong place doing the right thing. <laughs> he's doing the right thing in the wrong place, but he had to go to the wrong place because of the nation's sin. And so there he is, and the angel came. And he peered to him and said, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Now, God made a great declaration to Gideon. He declared that he was a great man of valor. But if you would look at Gideon, you think he's a little old fella, a little old chicken little, scared out of his wits, hiding trying to get done what in secret, hoping he can get enough wheat thrashed and get it before the enemy comes in and steals it. But God said, he's a mighty man of valor. I want you to know that the Lord sees in you something like that. He sees what in you can be accomplished through his mighty hand. And he declares to Gideon, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. You see, when the Lord's with you, you're top dog. <laughs> you're the king of the hill. You're the, you're the big kahuna. You, you, you're the, I mean, you're on top. Because the Lord, there's none like him. The Lord's with you, Gideon. You mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has this happened to us? Where are his miracles which his fathers told us about? That's a good, that's a, that's a good question. That's a good question. Why, if the Lord's with us, why is this befallen us? Good questions require good answers. Sin stops the presence of God, the purpose of God, the power of God. Sin. It, it is a stopper. It is a hindrance to the work of God and the people of God. Sin is like a spiritual shackle. It's like a serpent. When you dabble in sin, it wraps around just a little. You can move about. You can come and go. But it's there, that extra weight, that extra hindrance that keeps you from maximizing your potential because you harbor, entertain, encourage, enable, participate in, or overlook sin. Well, Lord, why is all this bef come on us? Why is this befallen us if God is with us? Because of sin. Where are the miracles? Where are the great things that God, only God can do? He will do to his people and through his people. And we're not seeing that. And that's what the church is clamoring today. Where are the miracles of God if he's so great? And the answer is still the same. Sin. Hardness of heart and unbelief. Oh, I just don't think God can do that. The problem is you just don't think. God can do anything he chooses to do. My God's that big. The only hindrance to God is you and me. 
our unbelief, our hardness of heart, our, in, our dabbling in sin, our accepting sin, our encouraging sin. We want to re, just like Israel, we want to redefine it. We want to enable it. We want to encourage it. We want to look at it and say, oh, well, bad's good now. Evil is holy now. Unacceptable is acceptable now. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, as sure as you are here and I'm standing before you, calamity comes as a result of sin. Where are the miracles? Where? Where? If God's will, why has this befallen us? I asked that same question a few days ago. And the answer is the same. Sin. Sin. And we've raised up a generation of people who don't know God. They know how, we, we've raised up a generation of people who know how to pass. They know how to, to get by. They know how to talk and walk and pass. And they're real good counterfeits, but they don't know what's real. God help us to get desperate for him. Amen. Well, here we are, and he says, well, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? Yes, he did. But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us in the hand of the Midnights. Yes, he has. And it's because of sin. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Boy, there's his answer. The Lord's with you. Not only is the Lord with us, you and I must understand and see he's not only with us, he's sending us. He's sending us out into the world, into the workplace, into the school, into the, the public sector. He's sending us, and we must go. We must do our part. We just can't sit back and, and in our comfort and in our, in our complacency and say, well, I'm okay, you're okay. What's the big deal? Sin's abounding. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Friends, we've got to stand up and be the abounder. Then he says, So he said to him, Gideon said to the angel, Hear my Lord, the angel of the Lord, that is. That's, by the way, that's called a Christophany. You want a, you want a theological word? You know, preacher word, a theologian's word, a Christophany, a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus Christ. That's a Christophany. And he says, and the Lord, uh, well, and he said to him, Gideon said to Jesus, Oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. And I'm the least in my father's house. Well, we saw great calamity. We saw great dedication, uh, declaration. We saw a great question. We saw a great answer. Now we see a great excuse. <laughs> oh, I can't do anything. Who am I? Oh, my goodness, I'm the, I'm the fifth-born son of Sam Vineyard. Who am I? They're, they're, they're stronger and well, ain't none of them smarter, but <laughs> just kidding if y'all watching this. Who am I? I'm not the firstborn. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? But friends, I'll tell you who you are. If you're in Christ, you're a victor. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You are, you're not, you're the head, not the tail. 
You can make a difference. God will use you. You will be opposed and you stand for a right and don't be afraid and don't run. Stand and watch God be God. He's saying, I'm the least of the, my, I'm, I'm Manasseh. You know what Manasseh means? Forgetful. You know, it's the county seat of Prince William County. Forgetful. I mean, Manassas. <laughs> Forgetful. Where are you going? I'm going down to forget it. I always, never mind. There's some wonderful people live in Manassas, I'm sure. I just don't know any yet. And the Lord said to him, surely, surely I will be with you and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. You will strike them. You will with me. I'm going to be with you and I'm going to be working through you. And so me I will do the job through you. Don't be afraid. Don't make excuse. Don't run and hide any longer. Stand up and be a man of God. Wow. That's exciting. Oh, it's going to get exciting. And so there's the great promise. And then he said to him, Verse 17, if now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk with me. Do not depart from here, I pray, until I come and, uh, to you and bring out my offering and set it before you. He said, I will wait until you come back. Now, a lot of, t I, you know, for years I, I've been, I've heard messages and teachings and, and I've read this uh, more times than I can count. And I thought, well, Gideon, he's going he's gonna to try and test the Lord, you know, the fleece thing. And, and, but, you know, we, we read over this. Gideon realizes that there's something great happening. And when you're in the presence of God, you always bring a sacrifice. You always bring a sacrifice. You always give him something. You know, in the Middle East, that's still custom. You know, when you go visit someone, you bring them a gift. You, you gift them. Being hospitable, being not, just, you give them something. Gideon said, if this is so, Stay right here. I want to go and give you something. Now, what does God want you to give him? I don't have your answer, but he does, and he'll tell you what it is if you want to know. What does he want from you? What does he want? You know, me, you know I'm, I'm not talking about writing a big fat check. Although that might be for somebody. But I'm just telling you, he wants something from you. And what is that? And then we see, Gideon went and prepared a young goat, unleavened bread, and, and, uh, and, and he, he uh, put the meat in the basket, and he put broth in the pot, and mm. We call that gravy. And he brought him, them out to him under the terebinth tree and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. Oh, yeah, baby. And he did so. And the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and unleavened bread. And fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and unleavened bread, consumed this offering. And the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Wow. What will God do with what he wants from you? He'll enjoy it. 
Now, you know, uh, Christmas is coming. Christmas time's coming. And we're already thinking, what would they like? Or what do they need? Or what would they like? They both cross our minds, right? What would they like? What do they need? Well, I'll tell you what God needs from you, and it's the same thing he likes from you. And that's that sacrifice. It might be time. It might be talent. It might be treasure. It might be a greater, a greater sense of determination and dedication and sacrifice of your time and your talent and your treasure. It might be to be a brighter witness and testimony in your, in your employment or in your neighborhood. But he will consume it and get joy. And I don't know about you, but I, I liked it when I put a smile on my, dad, my earthly daddy's face. I liked that. I liked it. And I can only imagine how my heavenly father yearns to smile from my sacrifice to him. Oh, God, help us to see America's in trouble. America's in trouble. We were in trouble way before this last election or the election before that or the one before that or the one before that. America's in trouble. We've been in trouble most of my life. I've been on the earth 59 years. We've been in trouble at least that long. <laughs> oh, it's not because of me, but I mean, I'm just telling you. America's in trouble. And, and instead of turning to God, remember 9-11, 01? The churches were full for about a month, and then what happened? <sighs> How many 9-11s is it going to take? How many 9-11s is it going to take? I forget how many hundreds, hundreds of corporations have said, getting out pink slips, getting ready to lay off, hundreds of thousands of people because of the health care thing and because of so much other stuff and uncertainty and the, and the political calamity of this financial cliff we're getting ready to jump off of. The debt is so high and, and our spending is addictive. And then why are we going to, I'll tell you, in the midst of everything, you offer the sacrifice God wants from you. And you walk with him, and he will be with you. No matter the country is going to hell, you and I can stand on the rock. Well, and then we, you know, he... he uh, he receives it, and Gideon proceeds with his angel of the Lord, and he said, Alas, O Lord God. Instead of calling him an angel of the Lord, he said, O Lord God, I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. He built an altar and called it the Lord is peace to this day. It came to pass that same night, the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, and the second bull of seven years, and tear down the altar of Baal. What do we got to do? We got to fight sin. We do. We have to stand against sin. I know that... The secular world says, All right, Christians... It's all right to be a Christian, but don't bring it outside the church house. But I'm telling you, we have to. We absolutely have to take it outside the church house. 
We've got to take it into the marketplace. We've got to take it into the public square. We've been silent too long. We've allowed the devil to, to steal our public schools, we, we steal the media, to steal arts and entertainment, uh, business, and, and uh, he's even stole religion. Had an opportunity to be involved with a, uh, in, a, in a situation with a, a man who was from an, another group. He's Christian, no doubt in my mind. But because of the situation that we were placed together, neither by our choosing, by the, by the choosing of others, I could tell he was very uneasy. He must have thought I had a second head and neck underneath back here. I could tell he was uneasy. And I tried, to, I tried just to alleviate his fears that, you know, brother, I believe in inspiration of Scripture. I believe in the virgin birth and deity of Christ and bodily resurrection, the blood atonement and salvation by grace through faith alone and, and, and the second coming and, and all those cardinal truths that, that all true Christians hold to. Inspiration of Scripture. I mean, of the whole shooting match. And finally, after... We'd been interacting for a while. I could tell that he was getting a little bit comfortable with me. Realized that, uh, you know, I didn't have any rattlesnakes in my pocket. You know, everything was good. And then I had an opportunity to go by his house of worship and and, you know, and I was looking at some printed material they had to pass out, gospel tracts and various things. And there was the truth about the Mormons. Well, you know, Mormons are moral people, but, but Mormonism does not teach salvation. Now, I'm telling you, it doesn't. Truth about the Jehovah's Witnesses, well, I'm sure there's some good, moral, nice Jehovah's Witnesses, but the Jehovah's Witness doctrine doesn't teach salvation. You follow Mormonism, you follow Jehovah, the doctrine, uh, the watchtower, it won't take anywhere but hell. I mean, you can get saved now. I, I'm, God can save anybody, but I'm telling you, those systems don't teach the truth. And then they had another one up here about the Campbellite movement, you know, the, the be dunked or be damned group, you know, Church of Christ or the Christian church or the disciples of Christ, you know, they teach you get saved in the baptistry. And God bless them, you know. God, God can save those folk too, okay? But then they had another one up there. And it's those people who believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're dangerous people. You've got to watch out. You've got to watch out. If you, you believe in a miracle-working, all-powerful God who can do anything. And I thought, now I know how he was scared of me. Or not scared of me, but uneasy with me. You know? But interacting with him, he, he realized that I was his brother. I wasn't the enemy. Now, I have met Mormons who have gotten saved. I've met Jehovah Witnesses who have gotten saved. I've met Church of Christ folk who have truly gotten saved. Yea, God! God! But we have to stand for the truth. We absolutely have to stand for the truth. Yea, God. Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. It always has consequences. It always, you know, remember what Grandma said? Sin, sin, what will sin do? It'll take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. And that's what sin will do. See it as a plague, run from it, flee from it. Paul told Timothy, Timothy, flee youthful lust. The older you get, the easier it is to handle that thing. But when you're 20-something, watch out. Do you understand? 
Flee it. Flee sin. Run from it. You can't handle sin. You can't whip it. But Jesus can. And so Gideon, God used him. He done some great and mighty things. You know, Gideon, you know, we, we often say, well, why, why couldn't Gideon be a man of faith? Why do you have to do the fleece thing? Listen, if you lived in that oppression for seven years and you had to live in a cave and you had to slip around always looking to see if the enemy's around to, to harvest your crops, to do your stuff, you'd be more fear-filled than you are faith-filled. You'd be more fearful than faithful. If you will, two words, fearful than faithful. And that just tells me that God loves us so much that even when our faith is that big, he'll nurture us along to where our faith is that big. Aren't you glad it's that way? That's just another thing to be thankful for. Amen.